takes a minute. All right, it actually takes three seconds, but this, it. This is continuing to yeah. No, no, we're done with twenty-five. Oh yeah, we are. We are all done with twenty-five. All right. So chapter twenty-six is all about answering this question: If they are related to chapter twenty-five is uh, basically making the argument that all living forms are related, right? And so chapter 25 is making the argument that all living forms are related. They all root back to a single ancestor that would have existed about 3.5 billion years ago in the form of a prokaryotic cell, right? That was what we talked about in chapter 25. So chapter 26 is all about answering this question. If they are related, how are they related? Mm. Okay, that's what 26 is about. So if they're related, if we can root all living forms back to a single ancestor that existed about 3.5 billion years ago, how are they related? Now, we talked about some challenges to that idea in 25. The textbook is not going to talk about challenges, but we talked about some of those challenges, right, of trying to generate eukaryotes. And we don't really have a good answer for how you get eukaryotic cells. And then from there, we really don't have a good answer for how you get multicellular life from single-celled life, right? Trinity. Is there like a title for the textbook? I mean, like, not that, but like... Uh, I think it's called Phylogenetics, Phylogeny, and the Tree of Life. Phylogeny and the Tree of Life. Yeah, Emma. How do they know life began before Well, the, you, they don't. Oh, um, but but the earliest fossil evidence we have of living forms are prokaryotes. Or, or, or actually, they're structures that prokaryotes make, not the prokaryotes themselves. All right. But actually, there is an idea right now swirling around that the original life forms were actually eukaryotic cells and that prokaryotic cells derived from them, losing the nucleus, simplifying form. Anyways, this is not a wildly popular idea, uh, but it is an idea swirling around, okay? So 26, if they are related, how are they related? And what we attempt to do uh, to figure this out is uh, we, we study the phylogeny. Study phylogeny, which this is the evolutionary history, history of a group, all right? So if you remember back to the first chapter we went through together, it was on animal behavior, and we talked about Tim Bergen's four questions. Yeah. Okay. And they basically fit into two categories. There were two proximate questions, and there were two ultimate questions. Right? The proximate were how does uh, the physiology or um, the you know, nervous uh, system of an organism executes some behavior. And then how does development influence that behavior, right? The two proximate questions. The two ultimate questions were how does this behavior impact fitness and how does the evolutionary history of the organism influence the behavior? This is phylogeny, and now we have an opportunity to actually talk about this, where how did these organisms come to be? What organisms are they most closely related to? All right. And then inside of here, let's see if the orange works. We can use this to classify. Okay, so we can use the evolutionary history of a group to classify these organisms. And we call this systematics.
And do you remember me telling you that phylogenetically we are fish? Yeah. You remember me making that statement? This is under this way of classifying organisms, systematics. Okay, phylogenetically or using systematics, we are fish because all of your names have to represent an ancestor and all of the descendants of that ancestor. Okay, so since the idea is that tetrapods, including us, evolved from fish, if fish is a is a grouping, then it has to represent also all of the descendants, which would include us, which makes us fish. And it also makes birds dinosaurs, right? And us and apes are sister. So we would be apes, sister taxa, but we would also be apes because our ancestor would have been classified as an ape. But we didn't come from apes. Uh, we didn't come from chimpanzees. But the idea is we did come from an ape. But, but not any of our modern ape species. But Adam came from dirt. Correct. And so we have some issues here, right? And so the Bible, the biblical story is inconsistent with that idea of human origins. Yeah. So we'll, we'll talk about that, okay? All right. So we represent this using phylogenetic trees. So phylogenetic trees show these relationships. All right, I want you to write that down, then I'm going to draw a tree for you, and I'm going to point out some important features on this tree. And I'm not just going to do a general tree, I'm going to do a meaningful tree. Is it? Oh, because I'm shaking the table? Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I just thought you meant because it was distracting, but I'm literally shaking the table. Emma. Um, so you know how like, some trees shed their bark? Uh, like, sure. Bark, like, falls off? Yeah. Is it like stuck on at first? Like, it fully is coated in bark and then the bark can spew off? And yes. Why does that happen? It's like what? there? Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean it's, it's separating from the outer layer. So. Um, sometimes, a lot of the times when trees are shedding their bark, it's because animals got underneath it and actually physically separated it from the underlying layers. And then the underlying layers, if the bark falls off, they will harden like that and, and will develop a similar structure in some trees. Bats really like to nest underneath the bark of trees. So... That's kind of fun. You know, when you see bark peeling off a tree and you peel it back and there's a bat there? Uh, it's, what? It's a great, I don't know that. It's a great experience. All right. So are we okay with this? Okay. All right. You want to hear something really sad about bats? So there's a, there's a fungal infection that... Fungal. That's, uh, that's basically an, an, an epidemic. And I don't think you use the, the term epidemic for animals. I, I think it'd be epizootic. But anyways, it's called white nose syndrome. And it spreads when the bats all go into a similar place to hibernate over the wintertime. You call that the hibernaculum. And so a number of bat species, the populations are just plummeting because of this white nose syndrome. Which is sad because bats do a wonderful job eating insects. And so without... Without without bats, it's just it's not good. Sorry, a beetle. You mean like pound for pound? So crickets have seventy five percent of the protein as beef, pound for pound, but require a hundred thousand times less water to bring it to market. Protein of the future, crickets, lab raised meat. Lab-grown meat is probably a better way to say it. Lab-grown meat and crickets. All right, anyways. So in the textbook, it shows you a phylogeny of carnivores. And this is one order of mammals. That's an interesting phylogeny. It's on the screen now as I, my voice is being recorded. But I want to show you a different phylogeny. 
okay? So here's a phylogeny, and I'm gonna draw it this way. You can, you can just as easily draw it landscape, but I'm gonna draw it portrait, okay? Should we draw this? You should draw this, absolutely you should. How much space do you think I'm gonna use? Uh, I would give you, I would give yourself half a sheet of paper. You're going to wait until I'm finished. Is that what you said, Issa? That's a great idea. That is a great idea. All right. So there you go. Draw this shape. Leave yourself some space to put some names. But yeah, draw this space. Leave yourself some space to put some names up here. And that's the whole tree we're just going to put in the name Yes, that's the whole tree. Okay, that's it. Uh -huh. All right. Humans. <laughs> okay. All right, now I want to point out some features of this tree before I put the names in. Have you drawn this? No. It's, it's yes. not that complicated <laughs> of a shape. No, I like it to look nice. I'm the first thing you're so mad. <laughs> mad? I don't get mad. That's weird. That was more like <laughs> disappointing. I get mad at myself. No, so <laughs> I, I, I do get mad. But it takes a lot to get me mad, and then it and then it tends to like boil over. Can I have a, like, a thirty second story. This is really funny. A thirty second story. Can you wait? It's Just a moment. It's the funniest so, thing. So, so is it about me? No. Okay. It's really funny. All right. Write it down. So, shh. These right here are called branches. Okay. These right here are called branches, and what they represent. What they represent is a group of organisms. Okay? These are branches, and I know you're like, Dr. Engel, that is one branch that you're pointed to. You're right. But then there are, this is a branch, 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 and this is a branch. There are branches. It's all right. Start over. Okay. So these are branches. This right here. Do you see that? Yeah. That right there is a node. N O D E. It is a node. And what it represents is an ancestor. A N C E S T O R. Okay. So here is a node. So here is a branch. Here is a node. The branch represents a group of organisms. The node represents a specific ancestor. Bless you. Bless you again. All right. So now let's put some now let's put some organisms in here, okay? Oh, I know what that is. Homo sapiens sapiens. Why do you say twice? Because this is a subspecies. So this is the genus. This is the species. This is the subspecies. I know, it's not always, because watch this. Watch. Homo sapiens sapiens. Homo sapiens sapiens. Emma. Um, do, like, all the things have to be number one, like, the like, Do they all need to be yeah. even? Yeah. So where they all end at the same yeah. point? The yeah. thing about a phylogenetic tree, and we'll talk about this in a minute, yeah. is... It going all the way to the end indicates that it's a living species. If it isn't, you will tend to draw it shorter, but even sometimes that's... Well, then everything else is... Is usually what is implied by that. Trinity, did you have a question? Yeah. 
Okay, yeah. yeah. Can you repeat the components of the name? Yeah, so this is the genus. This right here is the species. And this right here is the subspecies. Sometimes called the breed. Breed and subspecies are, are synonymous. Mm. Subspecies and race are synonymous. Subspecies and breed, I think, are also synonymous. Really? All right. Homo sapiens. Cro-Magnon. Cro-Magnon? Man, I don't know how to spell this. Is that I-N? Yeah, that's what I wrote. But I think it's actually O-N. I don't know. I'll leave it as I-N. It's not spelled. I'm pretty sure it's... Yeah. Oh, if breed is synonymous yeah. with subspecies? Well, I know race race is synonymous with subspecies. So the way we use race commonly is not a biological meaning of race. Race is equivalent to subspecies, but there's only one living subspecies of human, and it's Homo sapiens sapiens. So we use race differently. This right here, is our, yeah, these are humans, and this is us. Yeah. C R O M A G N I N. But I think it's actually, now that I wrote this, I think it might be N O N, but anyways, okay? So this is a different subspecies, same species. And I'll put in parentheses here these are cavemen. What does that even mean? That's a wonderful. Like, it's because you find them in in, in anthro what is it what anthropology but then archaeology so you find uh, archaeological evidence of cave paintings and of, of highly sophisticated societies but there's something I mean there's some morphological differences and they aren't they don't seem to be as intelligent and they don't form you know complex you know cities with. Uh, they don't have agriculture. They're they're hunter gatherers. Okay? They they haven't started to domesticate certain crops. Yeah, Ethan. Do their grunts like? I don't know. We'll talk about this in a minute. But uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they have very highly sophisticated paintings, so they they were capable of high levels of communication. Yeah. Um, what is the C word? C R O M A G N I N, but I think it might be N O N. N. The last two are N. N O N. I wrote N I N, but I think it might be N O N. You could do either. All right. Are you the only one that can do this? Oh my gosh. I forgot how long these species names are. Neanderthalensis. N E A N D E R T H A L E N S I S. Neanderthalensis. Who comes up with these names? I don't. Uh, I mean, the people that discovered the fossils. Why can't they just call them shorter names? I don't know. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there are any described subspecies. This is, these, this is the only living group here. So, but these are, these are Neanderthals. Okay, Neanderthals and cavemen, different, different common names. Okay, they're referring to different species. Now, what's, anyways, we'll, we'll save that discussion for a minute. Okay, so Homo Neanderthalensis, and then this one, Homo erectus. Yeah, Karen. So the node for each of the like, levels of the phylogeny, um, 
You don't write that in. You just understand there is an ancestor. Yes. Yep. So this would represent an actual ancestor, but you don't write what that ancestor is. And then we'll talk a little bit more about like what types, what pieces of information can we decipher from this um, in a minute. Yeah, Trinity. Um, are Neanderthals like the ball, 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 the overwhelming evidence that they built societies together and that they bred together. If you are, if you have any European descent, I think I may have mentioned this before to you, you are most likely somewhere between four and 7% Neanderthal. If you are of any European descent, okay? If you're, if you're not of any European descent, your percentage may be lower but it may, it, it, it's interesting. Um, anyways, so there's overwhelming evidence that Homo neanderthalensis has built societies and intermarried with our species. There's less convincing evidence that this species, Homo erectus, did as well. There's Homo erectus? It's, I mean, I, I, I don't think there is a, well, oh, there is a, there is a common name, and I can't. Java Man is a uh, um, is an Asian uh, fossil f discovered in Indonesia, and I think Java Man is Homo erectus. But then there's another there's another group. Yeah, Isa. Can you tell the um, which of some like of a human by their fossil like their bones? Um, potentially, although it, 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 it might be, it might be difficult. Um, you could certainly do it by their genetics, uh, but as far as by their skeleton, maybe, um, but I can't. If so, you're asking me if I can, yeah. I cannot. Others so, may be able to. Yeah. Like, like, let's say, like, uh, like, like this one, like, 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 that something that they would use? Well, in a skeleton, you're not going to you're not going to see that. You won't see oh, the right. ears and the so nose. Is the same skeleton? No, but you'd see like the location of the cheeks and the size of the forehead and the shape of the forehead and the size of the jaw and the shape of the jaw and the space in between where your nose would end and your you know where your your teeth terminate. I mean, you can see features like that, but some what's that? Teeth, teeth turp yeah, like where they end. Like yeah. All right, so there's one more piece of information I want to point out on this, and then we can start talking about what can we actually decipher from this. Uh, so these two right here, let me use a different color. These two right here are sister taxa. Okay. These are sister taxa, and what that means is they share a recent common ancestor. They share an ancestor more recent than they do with any other group. Okay, So again, sister taxa, they share an ancestor more recent than they do with any other group. Now, these... Would be what? They would also be sister taxa. <laughs> but this Homo neanderthalensis would be a sister taxon with both these groups, and only if you considered both groups. If you only pulled one of these groups, it would not be a sister taxon with this, and it would not be a sister taxon with this, but it would be a sister taxon with this branch that represents both species. Hang on, one more, one more second. Not literally one second, but. And what would these be? Same thing, these are sister taxa. But only if you include this entire branch, which represents now all three species. Okay, so we've got Emma, then Trinity, then Kate. 
Okay. Can we do one and then they can go and then we can cut? Okay. So can you kind of explain how from like one ancestor you get all those? How from one ancestor yeah. you get? We've already talked about this. Speciation events. Oh, that's it? Yep. Okay. And so and most most likely they are going to be allopatric speciation events. Mm-hmm. Although what's interesting is we have evidence that these build societies together. So how do you get an allopatric speciation event if they're not geographically isolated? So that it would mean that these would probably most likely be a sympatric speciation event. But yes, I mean, all of these, if you're going to split one branch and split it into two, uh, that's, that's a, a divergence between two species, which is a speciation event. Trinity, then Katie, then we could go back to Emma. Are taxa and taxa the same thing? Taxa is the plural of taxon. Okay, gotcha. Yep. Katie. Uh, yeah, it's just a, it's just a group. Oh, okay. So, like, um, I mean, it could be any level. Yeah. So it could be, like, it's, if you want to do Kingdom Animalia is a taxon. Oh, okay. Uh, phylum Chordata, which is our phyla, our phylum is also a taxon. And then we've got, we are in subphylum Craniata, that's also a taxon. Okay. Yeah, so it's just, it's, it's a group. Yep, it could be at any rank. But it's a group of, of living forms. Now, it could just be a single species is also a taxon because it's a group of forms within that. An individual cannot be a taxon, but a species could be. All right, now back to Emma. Okay, so earlier you mentioned, like, um, like determining, like, this new group structure. Yes. So it's, like, kind of hard to do that when you're talking about, like, the same size bone. No, not at all. Oh, okay. So yeah, there's an enormous amount of variation in skeletons. Just different developmental, yeah, different developmental processes. I mean, the same processes, but different, uh, what you would call allometric uh, features. But yeah, I mean, differences in development, differences in genetics. Yeah, for, for sure not. So even if, even if I were not really overweight, you would see differences in my skeleton versus somebody else. Yeah, Lisa. Do you need all your ribs? Do you need all your ribs? I mean, no, you can have ribs removed and... and so this one right here. Because it takes this right here and it makes oh. your brace, like, tape Oh, wow. Okay. So, now we need to start talking about what information can we actually gather from this tree. Okay? So, all right. Okay, so Tori, you asked, what do we do with this, right? How do we explain cavemen? And so uh, the idea here from this phylogenetic tree is you are representing the evolutionary trajectory of a group, okay? So you are representing that. Basically what you are saying with this tree is that here we originally had one species that then through a speciation event became two species through another speciation event one of those species became two and through another species event one of those species became two more right so that's what you are saying with this tree you are illustrating the evolutionary trajectory of this group okay that's one piece of information that we can glean from this you are also illustrating which groups are more recently were more recently one species than others. Now here, these two are still one species, different subspecies, but they're still one species. But these are two separate species. But it, you don't have to move through as many steps to get to the ancestor of these two groups as you would to have to get to the ancestor of all of the groups. Does that make sense? So we would say, our species shares a more recent ancestor with Homo neanderthalensis than it does with Homo erectus. Okay? So this is what I wanted you to do for your homework, was to find some of these phylogenetic trees spread throughout the textbook, and then to go through and find what are they using to actually build these trees. And so we have a question here. What are we using?
to actually build these trees. Because what's interesting is we have different species concepts. Somebody remind me what the biological species concept says. The biological species concept? Yeah. It's if something, then this. Carrie. If they're the same species. Then they're the same species, right? If they can reproduce, then they are the same species. If we have genetic markers from Homo neanderthalensis, there is overwhelming evidence that our species can reproduce with Homo neanderthalensis. Therefore, according to the biological species concept, we are the same species. But that is not our only species concept. What else do we have? Yeah. Morphological species concept, which basically says what? If we look alike, then you are likely the same species. Meaning, if we're going to separate these, we, we ought to look different. You should be able to take a skull and determine whether it is a Neanderthal skull or a skull of our species. And we can do that. Then we also have the ecological species concept. Yeah, Emma. Um, they fill the same niche, then they're the same species. They fill the same niche, then they are the same species. So we, we probably should be able to show evidence that we fill different niches, but we can't. Okay, we actually, they, there's actually overwhelming evidence that maybe even all three of these species built societies together. Except for actually this species doesn't have any um, groups that old, but there's, a, there's a, a place in Europe, it's called the Dimenisi site, where most of the species have been identified to this, but there are some that look like they are ne Neanderthals. And so this is where it gets a little bit more interesting because we're not really filling a different ecological niche. There's evidence that we can reproduce together. So really you have one piece of, uh, one species concept that would suggest that they are separate species. Yeah. Okay, Lisa. so you know how you're saying Nick that Carey. the Neanderthal is only related to the, to the, to both of them, not just one of them? Neanderthal. Yes, yeah, it's a sister taxon with this branch that then diverges into two species. By branch, do you mean like it's a, it's a hybrid of them two? Uh, yes, absolutely. So it's only related to the hybrid, not... The well, it's only a sister taxon with the hybrid. It's related to everything. Okay, the, the, the tree, if you're putting organisms in the same tree, you are representing relatively close relationships so among all of them. Representing all three species, a hybrid of all three uh, yeah, well, it's a sister taxon with, the yes, the hybrid of all three. Um, or if they don't hybridize what used to be a single species, because if they split and they no longer hybridize, but they do, right? So it would be the hybrid of those two species. Of the the, the sapien, sapien. So how are they related? So if you just took this species and our subspecies, uh, there's no, like, direct name for how you would say that they're related. Yes. Yes. Yeah, but I mean, there's not like a specific term for how close. Hang on, let me get Carrie and then we can go back. Um, do you need all three genealogical speciation concepts for it to be considered a species? Or no. Is it uh, it's interesting. It's the person who makes the most charismatic arguments gets to determine whether you have two species or one. Oh. Right? I mean, ultimately it becomes... What, do mo what does most of the scientific community adopt? Is it two species or one? But really it all roots back to whoever's the most charismatic person to campaign for their point. Now, most people are splitters. So you, you, anyways, you, ha you have terms that apply to this area of phylogenetics, and they're called splitters and lumpers. Splitters want to split things into separate species. Lumpers want to put things together into a single species. Most people are splitters because if, you're a, if, you, if you are a splitter, then it makes them more likely that you are going to be able to describe something that you argue is a unique species and a separate species. Isa? Can you explain what sister taxa is? Yeah, it just means the sister taxa, just like sisters, mm -hmm. they share a more recent ancestor with each other would be their parents mm -hmm. than they do with any other individual. So that's the idea of sister taxa. 
is they share a more recent ancestor than either does with anyone else. So you can't do Homo neanderthalensis and our subspecies because their, their shared ancestor is further from our subspecies than this ancestor is, right? But you could do Neanderthals and this hybrid form because that would be their ancestor and that's closer than any other ancestor of this hybrid form. Because this is not an ancestor of this hybrid form, it is that hybrid form. Right. Okay. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna take a little lecture break, and we're gonna go outside, and I have an activity for us to do, and then Rick is gonna tell us a story. Okay. But after what? Well, no, after after we finish our activity. Okay. Shh. All right. So, a um, couple more things <clears throat> just about how we build these trees. But before we do that, are there any other questions about this? So, in terms of, regardless of your view of origins, it is very, very difficult to argue that all three of these species are not connected. Okay? Regardless of what your view of origins is. It's very difficult to make that argument. And so from a, uh, an evolutionary perspective or a naturalistic perspective, the idea here is that you're getting closer and closer to our species and further and further away from the ancestor that we share with chimpanzees, okay, is what you'd be looking at here. If what the Bible teaches about a historical Adam and Eve is true, which I think there's a lot of reasons to believe that it is, instead what you're looking at here is diversification that happened after Adam and Eve. That you had some groups that became partially or fully reproductively isolated and started to accumulate some unusual morphological features as a result. Similar to what we find in reproductively isolated groups of humans now. For instance, there are some Amish groups that have very high percentages or a very high, what's the term I want to look for? Very high prevalences of polydactyly, having multiple, more than five digits on the hands and feet, and really high prevalence of different types of achondroplasia, which are skeletal abnormalities. Yeah, Carrie. Um, so Adam and Eve have been like Homo sapiens sapiens, or would they have been? No, very likely not. And then so we have a question: Would they have looked more like our species or one of these? And I think because of how geographically isolated these groups are, they probably would have looked more like our species, which has a wider distribution, even at the point at which it starts first appearing. Uh, in fossils has a more wide geographical distribution, but I don't know if that's actually the case. Yeah, Emma. How do extra limbs in the species develop? Extra limbs? Uh, it can develop in a number of different ways. It could be an issue in what are called master control genes that we'll talk about in a little bit, where they're active in places where they shouldn't be. And so master control genes turn on other genes for the development of particular structures. And so they can be active in places where they shouldn't, and so they're turning on genes that shouldn't be turned on, which result in the development of a structure in an abnormal place. Um, uh, extra digits, uh, again, I mean, it's just you're developing more of something than you should. It usually is an overexpression of one of those master control genes. Kyle? Yeah, because my grandpa, he was born with six, Fingers on each hand. I was supposed to be two, but it kind of like stayed. Yeah, that's a specific. That's a specific mutation. So there's a specific mutation that is related to polydactyly. So that's cool though. Playing the piano is probably easier. And then. Oh, I had no control over it. No nervous control. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Shh. Now. If you're actually going to make a tree look this way, 
The only way to make a tree look this way. By the way, you could draw this landscape if you wanted to. Sometimes you'll see phylogenies. They draw a landscape. I, I drew this portrait, but it really is up to you how you want to draw it. The only way to make it look this way, as opposed to just not even representing this and just showing which groups are more closely related, the only way to do it and to make it look this way is to use what's called an outgroup. Okay, and so the only way to do this is to root the tree. This right here is a rooted tree. And what we mean by that is when you draw a portrait like this, the tree stands up and here's the root. Okay, the only way to make a rooted tree, so a rooted tree, and I'm going to write here, requires... An outgroup. Okay, to root the tree, it requires an outgroup. And an outgroup is something that is not related, or not is not related, but is not part of this group here, but is related to this group. So it's not part of this group, but it's related to this group. And so we would use something that we believe is related to these groups but is not part of it and so there you could use something else that is similar to these or what you could use is sorry this is in the way so i'm going to write it horizontally you should write it still vertically so if you were to use a chimp as an outgroup and you had specimens of all of these species you would end up generating a tree like this. Trinity, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, like, what do you mean by rooted? Is that like rooted? rooted means, so if the tree is not rooted, what you're going to end up getting is more, it's going to look more like a circle, and it's just grouping some of our organisms closer together. So it, like rooted, you're talking about the line right there? Yes, rooted, rooted to provide this line into where it all stands up, and it's, and it's in a, presented in a neat and organized way. Yeah. And so, um, so, so it requires an outgroup, and then they have to have, like, those things. Right, you've got it. Yeah, so the, the outgroup is in blue. So you've got to put something that is related to all of the taxa in your tree, but is not part of that tree. So which means it doesn't descend from this group here, where your root of your tree is but is related to all of the organisms in that group. Does that make sense? Yeah. Was there another question? Emma, did you have a question? Okay. All right. So if you're going to root a tree and you want to generate something that looks like this, you have to include something that you believe is closely related. Now what's interesting here is what does this assume? So in order to build this tree, what do you have to assume? That they're all related and that they're all related to this outgroup. So which means you can only build these trees that are supposed to illustrate the evolutionary relationships. You can only build the tree if you assume that they are all related. Then there's a question, but what if they aren't? Then you can't build right, and that's just, this is what chapter 26 is all about. It's Remember, it's answering this question. If, if they're related, then how? But what if they're not related? Then everything in 26 falls apart if you're trying to put groups that aren't related into the same phylogenetic tree. Okay? All right. There's one more piece of information uh, I want to tell you. <clears throat> um, one is what's called the basal taxon. The basal taxon is the most primitive group in your phylogeny. So it's the most primitive group in your phylogeny. It's the one that you would think would be most like this ancestor here because it branches very early on and doesn't branch any further. Okay? Would you agree that this branch formed early in our tree and did not branch further? Okay, basically branched at the bottom of the tree and then no didn't branch further. This one also branched at the bottom of the tree, but branched further. 
afterwards. So this is our basal taxon. And the importance of that is this is, it suggests that this is the group that is most similar to this ancestor here. So if you want to know what was this ancestor like, you would look to this group here. Yeah, Trinity. And that group became the homeowner. Yes. So then notice what we did with our out group. So our out group, we generated a bigger tree, right? And then the only way to root this tree is if we used a different out group. But assuming that this tree was nice and rooted of all of our organisms in our now new tree with this blue, which one would be most like this ancestor? What would be our basal taxon? Chimps. So which one would be most like the ancestor shared by all of the organisms now represented? The chimpanzee. And so that's the idea where, Tori, you were talking about, well, we didn't descend from apes, right? Because the Bible describes a unique creation of Adam and Eve, and I agree. So I think really, regardless of what your view of origins is, you really need a historical Adam and Eve to be consistent with what Scripture teaches, not just about the creation, but also about original sin and why you need a Savior. And so if you have a historical Adam and Eve, at least man needs to be a separate creation from the rest of animals. Yeah? Yeah, I'm just kind of confused with how, like, all the science now gets in the Bible. Oh, well, you, you have to really deal with it piece by piece. I mean, yeah. you can do generally. Um, generally speaking, there are four ways you can approach where there's disagreement between the dominant idea in science and scripture. Mm -hmm. There are four approaches. One is you can say that science is going to hold the most weight, which is going to force you to reinterpret Scripture. Mm -hmm. And so we've done that throughout history, and it usually doesn't go well, right? So the dominant scientific idea uh, during the Middle Ages was that the earth was flat, and we reinterpreted pieces of Scripture to indicate that it's teaching that the earth is flat. Mm -hmm. That didn't go so well. Right? We find out the Earth, in fact, is not flat. The Earth is not the center of the universe. And then we realize, wow, the Bible really never taught that, but that's what we, we interpreted our theology to, to teach that. Um, and so it usually doesn't work out great, but that's one option. You could say that science is, science is the most important source of truth, and so we'll reinterpret Scripture to fit what science is telling. That's one option. The other option is to, to keep them separate. Is just say, listen, these are completely separate. Like, I, I've got my science and I have my faith, but they're completely separate. It's impossible to do because there are too many points of conflict, yeah. right? You can't just keep them separate because then you have to ignore a great deal of what the Bible is teaching. So, so the first option is say science is the most important, and then you reinterpret Scripture. The other one is to try to keep them separate, and there you ignore uh, pieces of what Scripture teaches. The third is that you basically say, well, it's that science is a tool of the devil meant to deceive, right? Which I don't know what you do with that. Yeah. Uh, and then the fourth is to say, no, they're both valid and helpful sources of truth, but what Scripture claims to be is something science can never be, and that's revelation from the Creator. So where do you stand? So that I, I would take that fourth view. Yeah. And so what Scripture teaches... What scripture teaches bears more weight or should be given more weight uh, than what the dominant idea in the scientific community is, and it forces us to reinterpret data. Like, to just humbly say, I don't know how to fit these data in, but at some point I believe we'll have an answer. Right? And then we can go through it kind of piece by piece and point by point, provide alternative explanations. Like, so for this, I'll give you a specific example, Tori, and then we'll come here, is... Where, where it's, you know, where it looks like we have multiple species that are part, that all group together. And so you're like, wow, is this, is this proving that we descend from a, a ancestor? No, not at all. What I think it is suggesting is that there's a pretty significant amount of variation in what is human. And so what, what uh, uh, an alternative is we could go in and say, again, these must have been reproductively isolated groups of humans that descended from Adam and Eve that then kind of developed some unusual morphological features because of their reproductive isolation. Maybe smaller gene pools. So, 
Yeah, Tori. So what you're saying is like we should kind of keep science and like religion separate? So no, I would never advocate for that. So I would say that they're both they're that that scripture is revealed truth and science is a tool by which you can uncover truth. Okay, but I still don't understand where cavemen fit in there. Like after the creation aspects. Yes, yeah, so they all they like our species. Well, they're the same species as us, but they like our subspecies all descended from Adam and Eve. But Adam and Eve had cavemen and they were not like cavemen are less advanced than uh, our understanding of how advanced they are is dependent only upon what evidence we have. Right? So if we're missing a great deal of the of what their societies were like, then we are inhibited from being able to understand fully how complex their societies were. So when we picture cavemen, we could be like completely like it's not like well, even if you aren't, I mean, we have very simple human societies now, right? Like, so if you were to go and you, you were to work with Aboriginal groups in Australia or New Zealand or Southeast Asia or um, remote tribes in South America or Africa, and you were to compare their societies to a European or a North American society, you would say that their societies are significantly less complex, right? Right. But they're all still human. It's just they're the the cultural there are cultural differences. So you have multiple things going on. They are not any less intelligent than we are. They just there are big cultural differences. So if you I mean people leave these remote tribes all the time and they go and they get educated and they're just as intelligent as somebody that grew up in a developed society. It's just the cultural differences explain what you would be perceive as differences in levels of intelligence. So if all you had were evidence of like an Aboriginal group's society from somewhere in Australia versus all you had was evidence of what used to be a human society somewhere in Europe and you were to compare them, you would probably conclude that the European society was built by people with higher intelligence. But we know that that's not true. Because we have data to suggest that that is not true. That we are not any more intelligent than somebody that grew up in an Aboriginal tribe in Australia. Just, there are cultural differences. So just like timeline-wise, can we still can not after? Yes. Yep. And a long time after Adam and Eve. Because oh, okay. remember we were talking about flood models last week? Oh, like and so all of these are way after where anybody's flood model ends. All of those are all would be post flood, post flood human groups. Yeah. I don't know if this is true, but one time I heard that Albert Einstein had like really deep grooves in his brain which caused him to be smarter. I have no idea. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know anything about that. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, Michelle. Um, Requires an outgroove. Yep. So in order to root this tree like this, we have to choose a group that is we believe is related to all of the members of this group, but is not part of it. And that's what the outgroup is. All right. Okay. So what pieces of information can we get from this? So when you look at this, say this is our tree here. This is the outgroup we used to build this tree. What can we infer? What can we learn from this tree? Somebody tell me a piece of information you can take from this tree. Trinity. Yeah, so they're, they're, they're either they are related to or share some significant similarities with the groups of this tree, right? Because I believe that what the Bible teaches makes this is inconsistent with this, that we can't actually share our ancestry, therefore we are not related, but we do share some similarities. Yeah, Lydia. Like see how a genus has developed over the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you're, you can see... Yeah, absolutely. How it diversifies over time. It's not, say, develops because develop in biology means something very specific, but how it diversifies through time. Absolutely. Yeah. Are you like, saying, like, specific to this 
So specific to this or just in general about phylogenetic trees? Yes, then either are to Homo neanderthalensis. Yeah, Trinity. Okay, now, what we cannot say, what we cannot say is any piece of information about how much time has passed. We can say relative time, like that this ancestor was closer in time to these species than this ancestor is, but you can't say anything about absolute time. From a phylogeny okay you can't say anything about absolute time about like how long ago did this ancestor exist how long ago did this ancestor exist how long ago did this answer exist you can't get that information from this phylogeny you cannot get absolute time you can get relative time but not absolute time okay do, is, does that distinction make sense emma so like, can you tell that by confluence you could Right, so you could try to overlay this on the, the fossil record or geologic time, um, but just from this phylogeny, you can't get absolute time. You could from, or you could try to infer it by putting fossils in there. But again, we know that the fossil record is biased towards things that had a wide geographic range and existed for a long time. And then the question is, when in that long time are you actually finding the fossil? Is it right at the beginning? Probably not. It's probably more likely towards the end of when that species existed. So there, <laughs> there's some huge challenges there. So we cannot determine absolute time. And something you should never, ever, ever say is that, say, this taxon evolved from this one. Okay? You, you'd never say that. Okay? You would never even assume that this group evolved from its sister taxon. Okay. Instead, they both descended from this group here. The branch. Yep. Trinity. So, Why well, was weird? Because you were holding up your pencil. It looked like you were doing, you know, hook of horns. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Trinity. Okay. Um, so you said that. So you can say that the Homo sapiens sapiens came from that node right there. That yes, I but you 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 could you not say. That? Sure, absolutely, but you could not say that Homo sapiens evolved from Neanderthals, nor should you. But, uh, you would say that they both descended from the same ancestor. So then, in other words, Homo neanderthalensis would not be the grandfather of this species, but would be a cousin of this species. But didn't it, like, come from that? Well, they came from the same ancestor. But this did not come from this. They're both descended from the same ancestor. All right? Is that cool? Yeah. All right, may I erase this now? Yes. Thank you. Oh, wow, that's so kind. That's so kind. So kind. All right, so outside, I had you gather up some plants. Thank you, Mark, for putting that plant away, by the way. And so... Uh, I had you gather up some plants and then use morphological features to try to group them together. Okay? And so we have a couple of terms that we need to establish and, and describe and talk about. And they are this. We have two terms. They are homologies. And I think we maybe have already mentioned these terms. Yeah. And analogy. Good. So we're bringing them back up. We talked about these one when we were upstairs one day, and we were using them to talk about competition and how in a competition, when you have two closely related species living in the same area, you typically get character displacement and niche partitioning. Okay, do you remember these terms, what they mean? Uh, yeah, Carrie. Um, similar features. Yes. Similar features from shared ancestry. Excellent. Ancestry. All right. And then analogy. These are similar features that 
develop from separate ancestry. All right. Yeah, Karen. Oh, what, what these? Yeah. We'll talk about it. these are these are tools that we can use to build phylogenies. Now they could be morphological features, yeah. okay. but these so these could be so let's focus in on homology because analogies these here let me let me let me let me put this in orange. These are helpful for building phylogenies homologies. These are not helpful. Why aren't these helpful for building phylogenies? Yeah, Emma. Yeah, it shows the pattern of descent, right? And so if you share features, but it's not from the same ancestor, it's just confusing. It's just confusing. Kyle, did you have your hand up before? I did, but that's good. Trinity, you had your hand up. Oh, Okay. Okay, so these are not helpful. Analogies are not helpful. So we need to figure out whether something is a homology or is an analogy, right? Are they a shared feature because they came from the same ancestor? Are they a shared feature just because they developed to meet the same need? Like the fact that we walk upright and kangaroos walk upright. <laughs> sort of. They, they actually, when they're, when they're just walking, they get down on all fours and they, they kind of, anyways. Yeah. When a kangaroo walks, it does not walk upright. When it hops, it hops upright. But when it walks, it actually crawls. Yeah, Lydia. Okay. So, all right. Did you see on the news the kangaroo that almost drowned and they saved it? I didn't, but that's that's really sad, but great that they, that they saved it. You want to hear something really sad? When I was seven years old, I, uh, I would, well, I would spend my winters up in Idaho. I had a lot of family up there in northern Idaho. But when I was seven years old, my uncle and I were fishing in a lake. We had cut a hole in the lake and we were ice fishing. And over on the other side of the lake, a moose calf fell through the ice. No, oh, it was on the other side of the lake. And you don't ever get close to a moose, period. But especially a moose calf, because the mom is going to just absolutely tear you apart. And then I, I watched the, the, the cow, the moose cow, get into the water, push the calf out, save the calf, but she drowned. And I watched that, seven years old. And then I went back to my uncle's house, and he had killed a moose in the previous hunting season, and I ate some moose jerky later that day. No, later that day. He was, I think, inspired by watching the moose drown that he then... Decide needs some moose drinking. All right. So these can be morphological features. The homologies can be morphological features. Yeah, but she saved her calf. Of course, it's probably going to starve to death because there's no there's no cow to feed it. Excellent question. All right. Or. They can be genetic. They can be genetic homologies. Either way. Remember, these are similar features from shared ancestry. They can be, you know, a, a what you would call a phenotype, what you actually see, or they can be similar genetic sequences. Yeah. Um, so, for morphological, you said that, like, Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, if, if they are, yes. Yeah, I mean, it would, all, it would all come from similar genetics if they are homologous. So that sometimes helps you figure out whether it's a homology or an analogy. If you're building the same structure, but the development is completely different and the programming is completely different, it lets you know it's an analogy and not a homology. So like wings and bats and wings and birds, they superficially look very similar, right? They form a, they fill a similar need, right? Or they provide for a similar need. But when you look at how they develop and the genetic programming, completely different. 
Okay. All right. So you'd be morphological or genetic. We okay there? Yeah, um, Emma. Um, when bats hang upside down, how does the blood not rush to their heads? Yeah, it's a good question. So they have uh, all all mammals have have micro blood flow where you can shunt blood uh, away from. Yeah, you you can shunt it and and move it. Um, through capillaries and then back to other vessels. And so they have they have shunts that will move a lot of the blood away so that it won't go and pull in the head. Yeah. Um, giraffes, yes. Giraffes have a, a, a bed of capillaries to lower the pressure when they lower their head down so that their brain doesn't explode. Because their neck is so long if they put it down, the, the the pressure difference, if you allowed the blood to pull, would be enough that it would probably start blowing up vessels in their head. Like their brain wouldn't literally explode, but capillary beds would explode. But they have really fine networks of capillaries to shuttle the blood around so that it doesn't all fill particular capillaries. All right. Okay, remember that we can name the organisms based on their evolutionary history, right? And what did we call that? Phylogeny. Well, phylogeny is determining the evolutionary history. Oh. Systematics. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. You really came to you. Yeah. That's nice. I'm sorry for ruining that for you. So, um, but says systematics. And so what systematics requires, so you should write this, systematics to remind yourself that this is naming based on phylogeny, based on phylogeny. What this requires, finding, finding clades. Here's a new term. We're hunting for clades, and you're wondering, I know, what is, a what is a clade? It's a wonderful question, Kyle. So it requires finding clades, and what clades are, it's a, it's a group that includes an ancestor, And all the descendants. So it's a group that includes an ancestor. And that might be ENTS. It's a group that includes an ancestor and all the descendants. None of the descendants would be left out of that group. That's why... If fish is going to be a clade, it has to include all the descendants of that ancestor. So it would have to include us. Otherwise, it's not a clade. And it's just a, a taxon. And that's why dinosaurs, that, that if it's going to be a clade, it has to also include birds. Because the idea is that birds evolve from dinosaurs. Trinity. Oh, because that's you'd have to go way back to get that. Oh. We, we were we were narrowing it into a very specific group. Because like humans, like for example, we have like the biggest tree. Yeah, it'd be like, like if you right like like have you ever built a, a family tree for something yeah. for like yeah. a school assignment? Would well, be like, well, why don't you include you know your ancestors from the five hundreds in your family tree? Well, you, because you either don't know them or it's so far removed from what this is that it's just not part of the, it, it's not part of the discussion so at this moment. Chimps, away, chimps, are like fish. chimps are also fish, yes. And dinosaurs are fish and frogs are fish. Uh, I don't, I mean, I think they'll get, I don't, I don't know if they love it. Cat, I mean, cats are fish too and most cat species hate water. But in order for... Well, because they just have been, the idea there would be that it's been so much time since they lived in an aquatic life that they've become adapted to living on land. And so, 
And hamsters really hate water, but they're fish too. Oh yeah. All right. So a clade is a group that includes an ancestor and all of the descendants, and this is also known as, aka, a monophyletic. We're still talking about clades. You bet. A monophyletic group. A monophyletic group. What is that? It's a clade. What does mono mean? One. 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 Phyletic. One phylo. It's one evolutionary history, right? Phylogeny, phyletic, it's the same root. So this is one ancestry. So it includes the ancestor and all of the descendants. That is a monophyletic group. Yeah, Trini, uh, Tori. Ah. Tori. Why is one mono? Oh, are you talking about mononucleosis? I have no idea that. Yeah, I don't. I don't know the origins of the name for that. Yeah. Okay. So monophyletic group, clade, synonymous. Yeah. What's that? Fish is a clade only if it includes. Michelle asked, is fish a clade? Shh. Fish is only a clade if you include all of the descendants of fish in the group fish, which would require for all tetrapods, including us, to be fish. So the only way for fish to be a clade is if everything that descended from fish is also a fish. Okay? So this is a monophyletic group, right? So if you saw something like this, these terms, and we'll talk about these on Thursday. What do you notice that these terms are not? These terms are not monophyletic. So right from looking at these, if I were to ask you the question, are these clades, what would you say? No. These are no, because they are not monophyletic. Poly means many, many ancestries. And so this is dealing with a group where you're trying to group organisms together that came from different ancestors. All right? Have a wonderful day. Uh, I will just leave them where they are.